And here we go, 63 minutes out to race number one, and this is an action-packed 12-race Saturday card. About 65, 66 degrees currently amid partly sunny skies, but hard to argue with that picture from the clubhouse turn. Again, a little more than an hour out to race one on a Florida Sunshine Stakes afternoon. Jason Blue at Acacia Courtney, glad to have you with us. That's always the case, everybody. And we're we're in it today, Acacia, no doubt about it, a week out from the Pegasus. Uh, this is uh, a marathon day, our longest uh, race card of the meet with 12 races, but they're good ones too. The Florida Breds in center stage today on what's always been a, an iconic day of racing throughout the history of Gulfstream Park for Florida Bread Stakes for the Sunshine Stakes a little bit later on today. So Nice maiden races on tap, though, too, Jason. Yeah, it wouldn't be a Saturday without mm -hmm. some good-looking three-year-old maiden races as a part of the undercard. As uh, we start a little earlier, it's a hearty good morning here with that <laughs> 11.45 a.m. Eastern post. So we'll call this a breakfast edition of Gulfstream Today, one in which we take a couple of steps back to Friday's action. And first and foremost, next Friday on the eve of the Pegasus World Cup, how do you like that? Nearly six figures carried over in the Stronach Five. Yeah, how about that? We had some big prices yesterday. I think it was paying five of six in the Rainbow Six here as well. And throughout the sequence of the Stronach Five of all of our Stronach tracks in play, some big prices in the sequence. So hope that you're ready to take part once again on Friday, that low 12% takeout, and you'll have lots of money up for grabs. Now, we saw a desperate finish in yesterday's last race. That and hurt. it was uh, Take Charge Row against Spongy. <laughs> And had Spongy won, I would have anointed you, regardless of who picked what, the Beat the Expert winner. He ran or she ran great and uh, one to look for next time out at 15 or 16 to 1. But alas, we do have to congratulate Acacia. Three winners in yesterday's contest. We do. Thomas, Renee, and Richard. I know Richard plays quite often, so glad to see that you'll be getting a shirt. Uh, congratulations to all. And thank you to all who played, participated, over 200 people, participated in the free-to-play Beat the Expert. You you're up next week, right, Jason, for yeah, your swan song? That'll be my expert. swan song, absolutely. Yeah, Pegasus Day will be my last working here at Gulfstream for the Stronic Group, and it's been a, an outstanding and a very fun four years. I'm sure some some time I'll reflect on a bit later mm -hmm. in, in the week and certainly uh, throughout next Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. But, uh, yeah, no, I've got one more crack at that thing to come out on top, and uh, that's what I'm planning to do on a day we'll have that 97K Stronic 5 carryover. Rainbow Six situation, it's a big one, and it's certainly befitting of a of a 12 race Saturday at this time of the year at this racetrack with 600,000 uh, the guarantee and the threshold in that race seven launching pad four stakes in fact so you're talking two thirds of today's rainbow uh, sit as Florida bread stakes and there's nothing wrong in that department nor is there anything wrong Acacia with a 12 horse turf opener and that opening leg of the early pick five. Yeah, not an easy way to kick things off. I'm just too deep and though not feeling the most confident in here. I think Ghostly Beauty certainly on the drop, the one to beat, though she is not a winning type, to put it lightly. She's she a is, yep, She's yep. got seven in the money finishes, one win out of those 17 starts. But you have to include her on the drop. I took a little bit of a shot with Stormy Derby Day, second off a bit of a layoff and down here in Florida for Tom Bush. In race number two, I've got uh, two horses. Well, she's handsome. Firster from Mike Yates looks to be well spotted. Three deep in the third. And uh, that fourth race I'm looking forward to is we'll sit to see Lucky Law out of a bit of an eventful trip stretching out in distance. You have Courageously, who ran very well behind Kentucky Farrow. Um, it's just some nice pedigrees from start to finish there in that fourth race. And I wrap things up with the speed of Yellowstone Girl and uh, Strong Azteca, who picks up uh, Luis Saez for a $36 play. All right. Sounds good. Now, looking at the favorite right now, uh, hovering in that two to one range with the 59 on the clock, is the five Ghostly Beauty, who clearly the kicker with with Ghostly Beauty in this race, which is a two lifetime twenty to sixteen thousand dollar older Philly mare claimer. I mean, it's just simply the dip to twenty, and I was hoping even with her established bridesmaid status and the fact that she's been at times pretty inconsistent I was hoping like many are going to feel that this would just do the trick and be the kind of boost she needed to get into the winner's circle yeah she's a she's a tricky horse because she's been very good she's been consistent overall her last race was disappointing um, where she just she really didn't fire as much as you would have liked in there but I do think that that was a, a much tougher field top to bottom than what she finds today and is taking that drop in class again one for 17 five seconds two thirds so she's 
tough to leave off if you're playing a pick five or anything like that in here. So I took a little shot against her, though I do respect her on the drop. But Stormy Derby Day, I thought, actually ran okay last time for this level off a bit of a freshening. Um, she is one who maybe hasn't been the most consistent or the best, but she was running against Duffer up in New York, dropped in for the 20 last time and second time in Florida. Maybe this is just a good spot. And drawn well. I mm -hmm. mean, she drew yes, well she in this race with Luca Panici, who picked up a winner midway through yesterday's yes. card. Let's move on to the main here. We'll get on to race number two, which is a six furlong sprint on the main, a three-year-old Philly 12-5 maiden claimer. Uh, you and I uh, both both sixes here to close out uh, again the early double and looking around I just I wasn't overly sold and not that you've got a ton of experienced horses in the race it's more of a balance almost down the middle between horses with race day experience and first time starters but seeing Mike Yates especially with Miguel Vasquez mm -hmm. riding and sizing up who's in the field. This looked like a spot where, well, she's handsome, uh, might just might just be in a good spot here first time out. I very much agree. She's not a Cajun breeze. She's by handsome Mike, but she's out of a mare who did win uh, sprinting on the dirt. And two out of her four, four foals were winners so far. And this one has some pretty good workouts over the main track here. And you just said it, uh, a trainer that's very good with these firsters, with his go-to rider aboard. I also included the two between dreams. Now, this this barn for Victor Barboza, firsters, not not exactly uh, the top move, but did have a little bit of pedigree, and Paco Lopez aboard was what really intrigued me most. All right, let's move on. I think Paco picked up a couple of wins mm -hmm. here yesterday afternoon as we uh, move on to the uh, third race, a three-lifetime 6250 older claimer on the main track at six and a half furlongs, and I'm going to take a shot in this spot. I just wasn't overly blown away with horses that have been running recently on the main I track. I agree. <laughs> and, uh, you know, normally... The Seven Francos team is a horse I would probably look at with a, with a raised eyebrow, more of a turf horse throughout his mm -hmm. career. Yet that said, he ran fine on the dirt, three and four back. I know this race is a longer one, and it's not an off-the-turf race uh, as he tries to go six and a half furlongs. I just, in the end, I didn't know where else to go, Acacia. No, it, it's a very fair point. And it's tough. It's a tough gauge on this horse because his only dirt meant race was against Maiden Special Weight in his first start back in uh, October 2019. So it's, I think it's really tough to gauge kind of where he belongs. But I agree. He could just kind of find the right spot. I took the same kind of notion with the two friendly fella who I haven't really liked his last couple of races, especially two back when he took money, but it is a drop in class. He does have some natural speed and that was kind of where, what intrigued me most about this one, though he's another tough gauge. His win, his wins came on turf and a wet track. He's got some speed mm -hmm. along with the six uh, flaming heart. And obviously just a, it's a race. I mean, it just is a, a spot where the three moon pistol, yep. uh, despite being two for 23, he's he's likely to get bet in this race off <laughs> a good has, effort. He has the best last out race. I mean, everybody yeah. else you feel like has kind of their questions. Uh, I don't know where that race came from, but it was very good. Yeah, 66 buyer today mm -hmm. on the dirt. The others might say, did you get the license plate? Because yeah. he, he might just uh, destroy the field. Does he run back to it? Mm -hmm. uh, we're up in class here. And this is the point of the uh, the program at, at 110 Eastern, give or take, where the card uh, certainly picks up as far as intensity is concerned. And and uh, for good reason. I mean, this is a good-looking cast to boo to these uh, three-year-old maiden special weight runners on the turf. A bunch of unknowns. I mean, that is the one real underpinning of this race. There's just not a lot of prior turf form. That's not to say, though, there aren't a couple of key horses that have run well on this turf course recently. And why don't we get right into the five lucky law, Acacia, second now picking up Johnny V for Patrick Bean Cohn. And this cult ran very well. I, I think it, it is kind of out uh, so far as to maybe at the time you said, okay, well, what's the quality really in this race? But he had a bit of an eventful start. Um, just kind of coming from off of it, heard it pretty wide on the turn. He's first forced to go wide out here and then kind of almost pushed out even more for a young, inexperienced horse. And then he's pretty green closing after this. To me, he didn't look just like a closing sprint. My notes were that he was very big and I wanted to see him go longer. So I get my wish today as he stretches out second time. And just really the stride right here is where you can see it, where he starts to extend, almost jumping the tracks on the turf a little bit. That big closing stride is what intrigued me as he gets to go longer today. He does get to go longer. He's not the only horse again, though, with a good recent race, the springboard 
off this turf course because mm -hmm. I feel as though you've probably got the most important pre-race horse just as far as like lining them up on paper and that is the Marcassi train number two courageously who just ran ran a fine race against a good field obviously mm -hmm. won by a pretty nice turf horse so last time out. A Kentucky Pharaoh came back to win the Dania Beach and Kentucky Pharaoh got a 79 buyer speed figure for this maiden race then an 80 for the stakes win where he really ran very very well so I think that's why you see such a high figure for Courageously, who has some natural speed, was never going to clear behind Kentucky Pharaoh. Um, but I think this is also one that will will benefit from strengthening up after having a start under his belt, especially this far, and I like seeing them have a race. I took the four street ruckus, who does have a race, uh, not not a pretty race and a well bet race to boot. I mean, this horse really got well, bet Brittany up in Russell's Maryland. Been winning everything. She has, and I hadn't realized that she now trains for Adina and Stronic mm -hmm. Stables. And uh, and kudos to uh, Brittany, who we're both fans of, and continued success to her as she is uh, enjoying her first winter down here at Gulfstream Park. Even though it might be a little little nippy for this part of the country at about sixty five degrees at this point in the day. But anyway, I'm just hoping, quite simply grass will be a different ball game. I am just a huge fan. I know you know this about me. I love Street Boss on the turf, his offspring. You got the Dynaformer influence. And there's been there's been a couple of decent horses. In fact, there's one older sibling that won on turf and synthetic, but there's a Fort Larned actually who was second. Sir Sahib was second in the grade one Northern Dancer mm -hmm. late last year at Woodbine on the turf, so why not? Yeah, for sure. My biggest question, I realize it was November in, at Laurel, but with Brittany and how well she's been doing and, and her husband Sheldon riding, bet down to the favorite and he just didn't run a step, for me that's a big question. And obviously it could just be that maybe he's wanted turf all along and that's hoping, why we see him sure. down here. Yep. It's, I think it's a very interesting um, kind of angle for sure and, and intriguing to see Irad Ortiz riding. Um, the seven performing arts though, if you want to talk about a big pedigree, this one has it with Oscar nominated, Oscar performance award winner. I mean, what a mare this has been as far as production on turf. So all of them have taken a start or two to kind of get going. And this is a barn we know doesn't crank them up. Yeah. It's really about the long game and the big mm -hmm. picture with Brian Lynch. But that's not to say I would not be surprised if a performing arts or would be surprised if performing arts uh, just ran a big race first out. And we don't just don't see a lot of firsters, especially three year olds by Dan silly mm -hmm. in this part of the yeah. in this part of the world right yeah i love seeing that and obviously as somebody that grew up in the performing arts and with uh, the covid in the past year the performing arts have been really hit quite hard i think this would be a special one to see do well too real fast alexander valley is this a situation maybe like my horse the number four street ruckus we know he cost a, a gajillion dollars and <laughs> did not run didn't get bet didn't run but it is bill mott i I wasn't bowled over by that first start no. and wow. the medallion at a Taro's Tango and all of a sudden it's let's get him on the turf. But mm -hmm. I mean, where do you stand for a horse going out for a trainer? I don't think anybody's been as hot as Bill Mott has been the last couple of weeks. The here. barn has really picked up quite a bit. And to me, I don't think that this is a, okay, this horse wanted turf all along type of angle. I'm sure given the pedigree and given the purchase price, they would have loved to have a dirt horse. The thing is, is that physically he just kind of struck me as one that just isn't that sharp doesn't have a lot of early speed not that strong behind and sometimes those types of horses fare a lot better switching to the grass so this is kind of kind of be I think a where does he stand type of race and then you proceed with caution moving forward I'm going to give him one more shot as far as the top four is concerned but he really didn't run first out all right we'll run though however right into the uh, fifth race cashing out Saturday's early pick five on the dirt a sprint twenty to sixteen thousand dollar older claimers in this race and I'm towards the outside. In fact, you and I are right next door to one another. Uh, just back to the basics this afternoon for the seven. Pink Fizz, who I would like to think may show some speed getting back on the dirt. She had run okay on the main across town at Gulfstream Park West. And in a way, different type of race. Reminds me a little bit of both Mr. Leonardo and Go Mike for this barn, who aimed pretty high and then were getting back to basics and wound up running 1-2 in a nice exact in yesterday's ninth race on the turf. They ran very well, and Antonio Santos in 
another barn who's been in a good groove just consistently um, with some horses just kind of finding their proper spot. And I think that could be the case for Pink Fizz. I took a shot with Sharp Azteca, who... Strong um, Azteca. Strong, excuse me, Strong I Azteca. I thought I'd be the one making that, <laughs> making that Sharp Azteca line. Force of habit, I guess. Mm -hmm. Strong Azteca. We'll see if he, she lives up to, uh, to that. But um, blinkers on last time seemed to make a big difference as she went back to the main track. And I just think it's a logical spot to come back at in here today. I think the biggest wild card of the race is what do we get with Yellowstone Girl who turns yep. back in distance? She's the story of the race mm -hmm. uh, coming in off a very poor performance. You know, you, had, you did have a, uh, a Danny Gargan claim in that race in Sunny Isle Beach who seemed to take the sort of pre-race uh, maybe thunder and, mm -hmm. and went off favored, but not a good effort here on December 16th. It's a dip down in class, and does running for 20 just simply get her back on track? She is, I know we, we talked about our top picks, she is the centerpiece, mm -hmm. though, of that fifth race field. A very good point there. Mm -hmm. uh, let's get on to the sixth here before we take a quick timeout. Uh, we've got a five furlong made in special weight. These are three-year-olds. And, uh, and a race where just about everybody is either running for the first or the second time this afternoon. And that actually includes your top pick, a filly on the outside by Candy Ride. Speaking of Bill Mott, mm -hmm. second time out in the eight candy jar, who lost to a good horse in, in Phantom Vision when uh, when she met her here in mid-December. Yeah, I think that that's a strong race that she comes out of. I know you and I are both a fan of that race. Yep. And I, I, think it's, I think it's a live one moving forward. And she didn't really get bet that day. She ran okay um, with a little bit of a close, but she had a big heavier type of build to me, and just thinking that she's one that will really appreciate having a race now already, as far as the fitness does go. Comedy Town's the one with the with the pedigree story in here, out of unbridled humor, who was a very good turf mayor, five-time turf winner, and has been a good producer of horses both on both surfaces. I never can catch these live oak horses, though. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and it's been tough, because a lot of them have been bet, and uh, as big a fan as I am of the barn is 0 for 18 here at the meet, so I think that that's kind of where you have to, to, to take things with a grain of salt if, as far as betting. So we'll see if the pedigree comes through in this spot. And you've got, obviously, Rockstar Row, along with mm -hmm. the uh, Mott second-time starter on the outside. I mean, these are uh, two horses bookending the field. We're taking a filly against the boys, by mm -hmm. the way, but the Colt on the rail by Jamal just is just an obvious major player out of the uh, no K no lucky law race. We'll get maybe a little bit of a gauge yeah, of that earlier true. in the afternoon from December 20th. As we take a quick time out, we're just getting the afternoon underway and we've got a lot more coming up after this. Rise and shine here at Gulfstream Park. 11 a.m. on the nose. The sun is out. We've got a 12-pack a ahead on this Saturday, January the 16th, a day we really celebrate some of the, the best Florida breads in training. Such a rich history when you consider just all the uh, Hall of Fame-worthy Florida breads, including a Triple Crown winner and affirmed Holy Bull, my favorite horse of mm -hmm. all time, was a Florida bred. And uh, the tradition continues as Jason and Acacia welcome all of you back to this breakfast edition of Gulf Gulfstream Park today, and we kind of, we really put the pedal to the metal at this point on Acacia, as not only does the Rainbow Six begin, we still have those four Florida bread steaks, and I'm curious, because you've got a quartet of steaks in the Rainbow Sequence, what are we doing this afternoon? We've got forty-three twenty today, six hundred thousand dollars guaranteed. No singles, as I I think that some of the favorites and horses trying to defend their titles are worthy favorites and, and logical ones in some of those stakes. But I wanted to back myself up with a couple of 
big horses coming in. We start things off in a nice way with maidens on the turf. I'm interested in a first-time starter in Camby Lyon, who has a monster pedigree for Shug McGahey, but a couple of the ones with experience cannot be ignored. The Sunshine Philly and Mare Turf is in race eight. I'm using Sun Summers and Sugar Fix. I think the two logical ones. Sunshine Classic is the ninth. Noble Drama tries to go for the repeat, but I just could not leave off Last Judgment coming out of Graded Stakes Company for Mike Maker. In the Sunshine Sprint we, Sprint, we have another horse trying to defend his title, an extravagant kid. Super Stonehenge looks pretty tough, though, coming down uh, from Woodbine. In the Sunshine Turf, I think that's a very competitive race. I'm three deep in there. And then using three horses in the nightcap to wrap things up. And that is a turf nightcap, 39.10 for Acacia, $43.20. One three ten on the opening end of this thing this afternoon at about 2.45 Eastern with that first leg and a, uh, a three old made in special weight going a mile that seems to certainly have some some pedigree power and 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 power of of barns and uh, of course jockeys but a number of uh, hall of fame trainers in the mix including i think why don't we just line up the pecking order first and foremost with the mark cassie trained conrad the red who just ran fine in his turf debut and just struck me for this barn Never really consider the Cassie two-year-olds at times to be super precocious. And being a tonalist, I think this horse is just going to be a work in progress, which bodes well today. Yeah, that's very true. But Mark does have some very precocious two-year-olds throughout the summer for the uh, for the, the Florida Bread Stakes, the Florida Sire Stakes. But this one certainly didn't fit that bill. You can see that kind of loping stride on the inside. His fighting force, who was the favorite, and coming down from New York for Todd Pletcher, ran okay in stakes company after that. I thought that he really took to the turf, Conrad the Red. He showed a lot of improved speed, and I, I agree. I think that he's one that's just kind of finding his stride now. That might be the case as well. You would like to think with the number one, he's pure gold, who's a New Jersey bred by Vancouver, in fact, mm -hmm. for Michelle Nihay. We already talked about the Cassie train courageously, who you had picked earlier in the day. Well, he's obviously coming out of that same race against Kentucky Farrow. Yeah, he is. And and while uh, there's not much of uh, he's pure gold, he's kind of a small and assuming type. He ran very, very well, I thought, in that race uh, to finish second. Uh, and had run a good race, honestly, in that debut at Keeneland, too. I think he's a talented runner. They have to valedictorian, who was also very good on turf. Now, the seven Shaftesbury cost a ton. Uh, didn't get bet that strongly. Did no running first out. I would like to think Pletcher first out on the turf with a horse that was bet very lukewarmish. I'd like to just think in my mind with the lemon drop kid uh, damn we're going to see a far better effort out of this pricey second time starting cult by uncle mo then you've got the medallia first or on the outside who you took in the 10 can be lying is this a spot because shug may be not totally under the radar here but this horse could be a pretty good price yeah i think so 10 to 1 on the morning line i'm hoping we get a little bit of a price with this one just a monster pedigree um just as far as the dam and she was good herself and has been such a huge producer several graded stakes quality horses in the family and we'll see if this one can stack up and maybe make a little bit of noise in here all right sounds good let's get on to the eighth here stakes action begins as does it coincides perfectly at a quarter after three eastern with the late pick five a late pick five that i saw worthy of just building around extravagant kid uh, i didn't see the the program as far as the odds but i would imagine he's going to be a pretty short price there that gives me you know building this thing around his presence in the tent enabled me to go pretty deep in the millions turf i think that is the deepest field mm -hmm. on today's card yeah it's a real Great. all the races are good but that one has the most most depth and, you know, I just I wanted a, a handful or close to a handful of horses there. Nothing too wacky in the last race. Uh, I thought Sniper Kitten would would prove tough there, or at least I'm hoping that's the case as he dips down in class. I've got a couple of horses in the ninth and I'm two six nine to begin this afternoon mm -hmm. as we have once again the uh, the eighth race, which is a uh, the uh, Philly Mare turf at a mile and a 16th, a seventy five thousand dollar purse and a sugar fix. Why don't we start with her? Just a solid race over this turf course for Sappy Joseph Jr., beaten by a first-time Danny Gargan trained mm -hmm. runner in this spot in Queen's Embrace. Well, Queen's Embrace had already been graded stakes placement with Kathleen O'Connell and first-time Danny Gargan, as you had mentioned. But I thought the biggest thing about Sugar Fix was at this point she's taking the lead. She was, had the post-11 here. She was about three wide the whole time, too. She never saved any ground. And then having to make that early move and then run bound by a quality horse, uh, I thought that she ran very well 
well, all things considered. She ran great in that spot mm -hmm. and is an obvious major player coming back. In fact, I'd be surprised if she wasn't favored in this race. But there are a couple of other Phillies and mares in the mix, including the nine, Bienville Street, who just quietly seemed to raise her game throughout 2020 and was involved in that dead heat with the Philly that we like, who loves this turf course, mm -hmm. and Sister Hanan a week before Christmas. I thought she would run well in this spot. And I'm anxious to see what we ultimately get out of the two Kelsey's cross, who I think at the end of the day, maybe a mile and three sixteenths is pushing it with her a little bit, and she's back to a mile and a sixteenth yet. I don't know. She's been not inconsistent, but I feel like she's been in some spots where she hasn't won over the summer here or going back to the summer meet where she was clearly favored and came mm -hmm. up short. Yeah, that day at the spa race uh, where she was beaten in neck, even in the Monroe in September, you kind of feel like you would have liked maybe a little bit more. The blinkers do come off today, and I kind of feel like the same as you, that getting a, a shorter distance might be the key. She's been pretty ambitiously handled as far as the company that she's kept. That's, I know the Via Borghese true. wasn't yep. graded, but that was a very salty field she was running against. Uh, I, I wouldn't be surprised to see her run a better race today, and uh, I wouldn't be surprised to see Sun Summers run well. To be honest, she wasn't a, a horse that I was a really big fan of up, up in uh, Saratoga, and then all of a sudden, her last couple of races, especially last time, she really just seems to be on that upward trajectory, and as we always say, I don't know what it is with Mike Maker claiming horses. They tend to just really find their stride on the turf in some of these bigger races. She's in the program. She's on a, a nice mm -hmm. run, been in a good groove. Uh, one of four big-time players there in that race that we saw fit the box up in the eighth. As we get on to the ninth, this is the, the, the main event, technically speaking, the Millions Classic, $75,000 purse, mile and a furlong. And it's kind of neat, the durability and longevity. I've often likened the better Florida breads on days like this and throughout the spring, summer, and autumn racing season on this circuit to the New York breads, and many of which uh, come around and stay around year after year after year and I think that bodes uh, you know certainly holds true and bodes well for the likes of both Noble Drama and Extravagant Kid who in different races are looking for successful title defenses. Noble Drama I took as the traditional class and he won this race a year ago for trainer Dave Fox over a main track that he just he loves this track. Yeah we pulled this race from last year just because it's, it's, it's fun to look back on too and it's awesome because he really doesn't seem to care about the distance. He doesn't look like a mile and an eighth horse. He looks like a seven for a long maybe mile or type but he handled the distance without any problem this year closing running really really well and since then his last couple of starts and speaking to Dave Fox you hear from later he just felt like he was flat at Tampa last time and maybe thought he had a couple of excuses there not getting the best break but he's looking to defend his title he's now six what a cool Florida bred this horse is it's he's uh, just seems to show up all the time and we're glad to have him here trying to defend his title yeah absolutely off the and you noted the uh, mugged at the break at mm -hmm. Tampa, the wet track. I mean, I'm a fan of Kanane, you are too, mm -hmm. but uh, whatever. That race was like off in its own world. That mm -hmm. was a weird day at Gulfstream Park West, and lining them up in a straight line, I don't think Kanane, 99 times out of 100, could finish in front of Noble Drama. That mm -hmm. was the one time he did. So I, I believe Noble's got a couple of really legit excuses in his back pocket, and I'm hoping he just gets a clean trip and brings his A game. And if he does, I think he's going to prove a, a very – a shorter price winner of this race in the in the neighborhood of six to five or so. Now the the current Todd Pletcher and the former Todd Pletcher mm -hmm. horses in the middle of the pack they present the main danger to Noble Drama. Up first, why don't we mention because he's your top pick, the number three Last Judgment, who has at times maybe he's been a little erratic here and there, but he's run some fast races when he shows up. I mean, he's capable of some jaw dropping performances. He really is, and he's not the most consistent. You're you're absolutely right about that. And when he was racing for Tom Morley a couple starts back, and he beat the razor sharp Pete's play call, who now has been successful in stakes company. I mean, that was a good horse who was in form that he beat that day. And I know it was sprinting, but in the past, even with Todd Pletcher, he's had him going two turns. He's always really struck me as a two turn type of horse. And while he was well beaten last time, he remember being a really nice horse in Sleepy Eyes Todd, Forensic Fire, Mind Control, the horses he was running against in the Mr. Prospector were very legit competition. They were, and of course, Sleepy Eyes Todd is seven days out from his yeah. date in the fifth Pegasus Dirt here next Saturday for $3 million. A Roman Empire was beaten by his stablemate. You talk about 
inconsistent. Mm-hmm. Uh, that that has plagued Warstopper in his short career. But we saw we saw the right version of Warstopper in that return win. And I've I've always liked this Roman Empire. I think it's probably in large part because he's a Florida bred Empire maker. And there's been some stops and starts, but does he build off that race last time? And I think that that's a key to the fact that he came back off of uh, about a six month layoff, ran second behind his stable mate. Moving forward today, you would expect a stronger effort as he hasn't been the most consistent either and, and some okay performances, I mean, back in the spring. But at the time, Untitled and Wild Medallia Doro were in form and big players in the division. They definitely mm-hmm. were. Hope they're doing okay as we move on to race number 10. Sunshine Sprint in this one as we backtrack to six on the main track. And the spotlight really shines brightly in this race on Extravagant Kid, who much like Noble Drama, is in the mix to win back-to-back uh, a, a sunshine sunshine races this afternoon and here he is in fact running right by ladies island is that the race we pulled yeah, a year ago? i love this horse cool. i know you do too and and i would have shown last time but he is running on the dart today again and so i pulled his last dart win um back last year as he defends his title and he did it so easily too i mean it doesn't matter the surface he's now eight he's obviously still in top form and uh, i know tyler gaffleone as i got to speak to him before the janice says he just loves riding this horse he's so consistent shows up every time it's just he's a fun horse to ride and be around who's the danger and i'm gonna be really surprised if he doesn't prove best in this race as i would agree as Mm -hmm. a mega favorite Mm -hmm. it'll be i think a notable upset and then some and uh, like i singled in my late pick five i think he's a very logical kind of you know build build around type horse i see you've got some interest in the uh, live oak runner the number four super super stonehenge who I mean, if he can transfer that synth and turf form, uh, or mainly that synth form, Mm -hmm. what do you think? Because he could be a worthy foe. Yeah, he did break his maiden against Florida Bread Company on the dirt here uh, by 10 uh, back in 2019. I know it was a long time ago. But since then, I mean, he ran second in grade two company last time behind Ryder Comet, who we've seen uh, now be successful on turf. But I I typically, again, like these horses coming from Woodbine to have a race or two down here in Florida first. But he has been training up at Palmetto since the beginning of December and he's just a horse that I think has a little quality we'll see how he fares in here back against Florida breads but he is coming out of a, of a tough race behind a good stable mate and Jackson in the mix too mm-hmm. I mean he's obviously danced a few dances for Jose yeah. Pynchon and has run pretty well all things together and a, a very good fit against that field led by and large though by extravagant kid uh, sunshine turf is up next at a mile and a 16th this will wrap up the stakes action here and uh, again I think in a way we save the best for last because this is just a very very deep field one that includes Venezuelan hug who has been another just outstanding Danny Gargan claim who picked up here in late March for 40k is turned into a Florida bread stakes winner and prep for this beating second mate last time out of GPW and it says traffic and uh, bumped at the eighth pole he was off a little bit slow at the break and um, I think as we see him there the gray the number three the biggest thing for him was that he just didn't have any room to run and he almost had to kind of bully and muscle his way out I think that's where the short comment bumping does come in um, as he starts to kind of go outside ends up going inside right here this horse has turned out to be just kind of a monster on the turf. I mean, really his only bad performances was when he was running against Gufo and No Word in the Belmont Derby and then trying the Penine Ridge. He's a, a horse that's been aggressively handled, but I think really is a perfect fit in here having won um, that preview over at Gulfstream Park West. And he's one of three very important newly turned four-year-olds who are stepping up, I think, against the older guard. And that older guard is probably led by Galleon Mast, who is a 10-time winner from 39 starts starts and has been as honest as the day is long he doesn't look like the galleon mast of say a year or a year and a half ago but he's in the mix but you know regarding again the the former three-year-old that three-year-old class from 2020 we've got to mention the two proven strategies who man i watched from afar he got good down here for mark cassie started to string some races together mm-hmm. and it just seemed like once he got to new york i mean the, the needle the dial just kept going like this yeah i mean it's a, a horse that didn't break his maiden.
Maiden until he had already had five or so starts under his belt and running against grade one company a couple of times. But once he kind of did that and in Florida bread company here, I mean, he continued to keep the best company up in New York too, even uh, second in the Penine Ridge behind Decorated Invader. But I thought that Saratoga allowance win where he used that speed to his advantage was very, very strong. The present of Mon presence of Monforte in here might make things interesting for him. And that's why I'm going with the four Sham Rocket, who I know didn't run as well, wasn't far behind, but didn't mm -hmm. run as well against Venezuela and Hug in, in a number of their starts together last year in 2020. But I really walked away impressed from Sham Rocket's last start here and first for Todd Pletcher in the lead up before Christmas. The margin's three and a quarter, and it looks like on paper he just barely won that race. But I a, don't think a mile is in his wheelhouse at all, just a little too short for him. And also consider he was basically four to five wide throughout that entire race because Arad Ortiz knew he had to get going because this horse is such a, a grind you into the ground type uh, type finisher. I, I really like that prep for this Acacia. I'm going to go back to the four Shamrock. I give a ton of credit to Arad Ortiz for that ride. There wasn't much pace to run at. He moved him early and that was the right thing to do to get that chance to, to be able to get up there just in time. He really did a very, very good job in sensing how the race was playing out for him off the back of a win, and I agree, getting more distance is definitely a plus for him. Yeah, he's out a, a 16th of a mile, and that's where we end here at a mile and a 16th. In fact, in race 12, uh, right before 5.30, give or take, with the $16,000 older claiming race. Had a feeling, I wasn't sure if we'd pick the same horse, but had a feeling we'd, we'd more or less be towards the outside in this race, and I am very much in the camp of the number 10 sniper kitten, first and foremost, who was just, and probably in hindsight, if you want to split hairs, maybe moved a little too early last time into a, not only a better feel, but a pace that was just a towering inferno. And he was beaten by a stablemate, Morocco, who did come back to win again. And I know it can look like a pretty significant drop in class, but he did win an Indiana Grand two back. And I think it's just a kind of being realistic type of move for him. I also think that he has some natural speed and could maybe sit just off of uh, some of the main pace setters in here and get a really nice trip to wrap up the day. Number nine, Donji, just turned nine. Mm -hmm. He's done some good things. Career starts 77 in off a victory, and he beat a few of these, obviously, mm -hmm. last time out. Yeah, he did, including another who I had liked at 15-1 to 1 that day. Uh, so we'll see if uh, his third start, now getting Irad Ortiz, his third start in Florida, he runs even better today. 27 on the clock. Let's get into our lightning round on this sunshine <laughs> stakes afternoon at Gulfstream Park. And our first topic is Tax, who yesterday stretched his legs a little north of us at Palm Meadows in Boynton Beach. That is where trainer Danny Gargan is based. This is a couple of days back, but he had an easy work, his third since winning the Harlan's Holiday yesterday. Uh, and that uh, that work two weeks ago was where Danny had said he was really going to be doing the, the best, uh, strongest workout. Yesterday would just kind of be that maintenance work before the Pegasus World Cup. But this horse has really developed so much physically, and I'm looking forward to seeing him run as he's, he's – He's, I think, the perfect example of a horse that does become physically mature at that age of five. Now, the McDermott might be the spot, the target spot for the old pro coming up next in Sadler's Joy, who last year at this time was gearing up for a run in the Pegasus turf. He's a horse that's always done his best running in races beyond a mile and three sixteenths and a mile and a furlong. And here he is, in fact, winning the McDermott now mm -hmm. almost three years ago. <laughs> Which is pretty crazy. He's actually he's on the nominations list for the McKnight next week. So I'm not sure oh, if cool, they'll go right? there or sure. if they'll wait. But he's on the list as far as the nominations for the McKnight, which is always a fun race on the Pegasus undercard. But a horse that's hard not to like, Sadler's Joyce. He's just, uh, he waits to the last minute, comes with that big closing kick and certainly age on the racetrack. Well, that's the one thing I had to look up. I said, it feels like he could be 10, 11, 12, 13 years <laughs> yeah. old. He just turned <laughs> eight and he's banked about $2.6 million. Mm -hmm. He's had six workouts. That that breeze yesterday was his sixth breeze since arriving to Palm Meadows mm -hmm. for trainer Tom Albatrani. Now, in terms of our date in racing history, it's a date and a day. Sue us here. <laughs> Yesterday was the, the decade, the 10-year anniversary of Dave Fox's sprint champion, awesome. Big Drama, winning the Mr. Prospector Stakes. Uh, this horse prior had won the Breeders' Cup Sprint, was your defending sprint champion, 
and obviously loved this main track. He was a powerhouse. Yeah, he was. I remember getting a chance to speak to Dave about him a couple years back, and he just said that ride that Big Drama took him on was like nothing you could ever imagine. And now it's fun, too, getting a chance to see him as a sire of many Florida breads and seeing that legacy continue. Including Noble Drama. Mm -hmm, exactly. Yeah, or he's in that family. I yeah. think Noble Dramas have gone astray. But yeah. regardless, Harold Queen's got a, uh, a very good broodmare, and that female lineage continues mm -hmm. to uh, do well uh, a decade on and uh, good connections there and uh, some great memories with big drama. Uh, the Pegasus draw. We're racing here Wednesday. There's no racing Monday and Tuesday, naturally, but Wednesday will likely be a 10-race card. You and I will be hosting the draw online in the Sport of Kings. Yes, we will at 11.30. We'll be drawing the fields for both the Pegasus World Cup dirt race and turf race. The balance of the card, as usual, will be drawn uh, throughout the rest of the day. It'll be a sensational card from top to bottom. 12 runners expected in both Pegasus races, so be sure to tune in. We'll provide more information as we get closer. Definitely, and we got all the information you need if you want to get involved in the Pegasus World Cup betting challenge. Lots of dough, a great time, and five seats to the to the NHC in 2022. It takes place on Saturday. It's a live money contest. Make sure to check out all the information on pwcbc.com. Definitely. Now is today's Rainbow Six because we've got that gargantuan guarantee of 600,000. Could it be a, a Rainbow Pick 5 Acacia with Extravagant Kid and the Million Sprint? It could be. I used two in there, but if you are looking for a little bit more of an affordable ticket, I think that'd be a good place to single as he's looking to defend his title. Starts in race seven today it's a little bit later than usual with the 12 race card and that means with the early post though not only do we get a full field of 12 at 11 45 a.m we get to catch up with track announcer pete aiello a little earlier than usual <laughs> and he's coming up next with those saturday scratches and changes